ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today's guest is one of my favorite up to this point. His name is Matt Brewer, and he hails from Oklahoma, was raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and has been living in New York around the area for the past 17 years. He plays with such names as Gonzalo Rubalcabla, Greg Osby, Aaron Parks, Antonio Sanchez, even his own band. He's put out two albums on the Criss Cross Jazz label, and we're actually going to end this podcast with one of the tunes from that album, from his most recent album called Unspoken. And in this podcast, we even talk about his newest album that he just went into the studio to record a couple of days ago. I had the pleasure of sitting down with him at his home in Queens, New York, and getting to also see him perform with the amazing Aaron Parks at a wonderful club in the village called New Blue. And we talk about so much stuff musically, I get to ask him these awesome questions dealing with what it's like writing music, what it's like practicing when you're on the road and you don't always have your instrument, as well as just what it means to be a bassist and a working musician uh, in a band as a, as a sideman. I'm so grateful that I can interview people like this because for me it's the full circle of coming back to people that I heard about about 12, 13 years ago through a wonderful series that came out through KUNM called Jazz of Enchantment. And it spotlighted some of the amazing musicians that were connected with the New Mexico scene. And Matt Brewer was on that series. So from listening to his story as a high school kid to now all these years later getting to really kind of answer these questions that have lingered and the stories that I remember that I bring up in this podcast from that interview was, was wonderful and deep and profound. And I learned so much from it. And I know you're going to learn so much from it and get so much from it. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to get to this beautiful podcast. I thank you so much for listening to this podcast. And I encourage you to comment, to like, to subscribe, to review, and to tell a friend about this podcast if you like it. And really, tell a bass player friend if you know one. Because all of us could use a little bit of advice. And from some amazing musicians like this incredible gentleman, Matt Brewer, of course, each one of us is going to learn so much. So thank you for listening to the show. And enjoy. Mr. Matt Brewer, what's up, bro? Thank you for being on our talk music. Of course. Happy to be here. So how, how have things been coming along in New York? You've been living here for, what, seven, 16 years now? 17? Something like that. Yeah, I moved here in like August 2001. Uh, started going to school, Juilliard, for a little while. So. And you were at a conservatory before that, right? The boarding school? Kind of, yeah. What I went to Interlochen for my last three years of high school. Hmm. Yeah, it's a boarding arts school. So music and dance and creative writing and art and sculpture and all kinds of stuff. But Did you yeah. do all that stuff too? Did you do like a little bit of sculpture no, or just no, all you, music? You, you uh, kind of pick a major. Gotcha. It's a lot like college, I guess, but yeah. Pre-college. Basically. Tight. Yeah. That's tight. Now you went, you were from like, you went from New Mexico straight over to Interlock or where'd you? Yeah, I had been, I mean, I was born in Oklahoma and my family. Where in Oklahoma? Uh, Edmond. Oh. I don't, know any... I don't know where Edmond is at. I know Oklahoma, <laughs> it's, though. Where in it? It's close to Oklahoma City. Ah, so, okay. I okay. mean, the hospital was in Oklahoma City. Oh. And then uh, but my parents at the time were living in a little trailer park in Edmond, <laughs> wow. Oklahoma. Just a small, like, suburb of Oklahoma City. Like, maybe 45 minutes away or something. And your dad was teaching at a university there? Or what was he doing there? What was he doing? Um... Well, I know he was playing gigs and stuff. I mean, he's a trombone player and uh, wonderful freaking trombone player, man. I remember he came to New Mexico yeah. many, well, many times, of course. But I mean, I remember I, mm. I got to meet him one time at a jam session, and he brought his horn. Yeah, well, he's a great musician. Um, I mean, later he went on and like got his doctorate in theory and composition and stuff. But at, when I was a kid, uh, I think he was just playing gigs around town, like playing rodeos, playing like any gig he wow. could get you know, <laughs> um, to, you know, to make a living and support the family and stuff. Right. Um, so, yeah, I didn't get to New Mexico until 
I think I was eight when we moved to Albuquerque. Hmm. So, yeah. That's pretty cool, man. So you, so from eight until like 15, 16? Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And Interlock was where? where what it's city in Northern it? Michigan. That's the closest city is Traverse City, but it's also, you know, not a very big place. Right. right. And Interlochen is also the name of the town, but it's a tiny, like, there's nothing going on. It's in the middle of nowhere, basically, like, in between two lakes. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful, but, it's yeah. awesome. And so you went from there straight to Juilliard, straight, straight to like Juilliard. a scholarship, full ride or something like uh, that? Or just yeah, a- it was the first year they had had a jazz program. Really? Yeah. The first year Juilliard had just wow. Yeah. Who so was your was, teacher? Who you were like studying with and stuff? Let's see. The first year was, uh, bass teacher was Rodney Whitaker, and he was an amazing teacher. Wow. And, I mean, he's a super bad dude, a great bass player. Um, and then the second year was Ben Wolf. Ben uh, Wolf. Okay. Yeah. Also, like, unbelievably great bass player and really great teacher. Hmm. Um, they just gave me a lot of stuff I didn't know I needed. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Now, was, is it true? Because I remember we were talking about the Jazz of Enchantment, you know, uh, radio series that came out through KUNM many, many, many years ago. Mm. I think it was, I'm going to guess about 12 years ago, because mm-hmm. I think I was like a sophomore or junior whenever I first heard that. Yeah, that sounds about right. You were talking about how instead of bedtime stories, your dad would read you baseline. <laughs> he right? did do that. Um, <laughs> I mean, he, they, he definitely did both. I mean, there were a lot of stories also when I was sure. a kid. But <laughs> right. I, uh, yeah, he he bought me a lot of, I mean, as soon as I got serious about playing the bass, which was, well, I started when I was 10, and then a couple of years later, when I was 12 or 13, I think kind of made the decision, like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, he just bought me every book he could think of. Um, and some of the early ones were like i don't know like todd coolman's like building bass lines i don't remember the name of it it was like <laughs> walk the line or something you know um and yeah i remember like reading those books to me at nighttime and he also like wrote books for me i mean my dad really? would uh yeah like exercise books so as i was starting Whoa. to like get better at theory and stuff, he would just show me like, okay, this is what an altered dominant chord is, and here are the scales you can use, and so here's a, work, a workbook to, like, for you know the altered scale and all twelve keys or whatever. And, uh, you know, so how old? Are, like, would you guess how old are you then? Thirteen. Jesus. So there was altered dominant scale yeah, and twelve I mean, keys at thirteen. <laughs> it started with like you know major scale exercises, right, you know right, right, minor right, right. scale and half diminished. So I I still have them somewhere. I, um, wow. They're probably in the file cabinet. I keep moving around from apartment to apartment. But <laughs> it, uh, yeah, he even like bound them and everything. Made wow. little like official. Yeah, yeah <laughs> totally. Um, that is so cool. But also, I mean, my parents divorced when i was six or seven mm. and i lived with my mom so he would call and like quiz me on theory and stuff i, <laughs> I used to hate it I, 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 I remember like one call where he was like so good what's the sharp nine of a d flat seven chord and i was like oh come on and like you know technically it's e sharp you know it's like one of those trick <laughs> kind of questions so you're like oh, thank God. <laughs> that's awesome yeah so i gotta kind of thank shout out to dad for <laughs> <laughs> mr brewer yeah <laughs> so now i also remember from that jazz of enchantment uh interview you talked about your mom and your dad would put headphones on your mama's belly whenever you were a baby before mm-hmm. you were even born yeah classical music and jazz yeah and apparently um i mean they said they played all kinds of stuff but yeah they'd put headphones on my mom's stomach and they claim that i reacted the most to coltrane <laughs> they're like you you really seem to like move and get excited when we played coltrane <laughs> um it is still kind of like the thing that resonates the most with me i mean coltrane's music is still like one of the most important things in my musical life or just really? in my life in general i think um but yeah, they used to play a lot of Debussy and just, I don't know, anything they were into, I guess. If you had to pick a favorite Coltrane album, what do you think Ooh. that would be? 
Ooh, that, that's or super I should say, hard. I should say yeah. top three. <laughs> top three. Because there's so many different phases. Really, we could pick like top six of the different phases. Uh, right. I mean. <laughs> um, it changes all the time. Well, just Interesting. for now, I guess mm-hmm. the one I've been listening to the most recently maybe is Interstellar Space. Mm. And Crescent was a big one because yeah. that's like, I think that's the only solo of his that I've written out in its entirety. Like really? the, the solo on Crescent. Yeah, I went through a phase of wanting to transcribe things without using an instrument. And so I started with easier solos and like <laughs> work, worked my way up to like just doing that one in its entirety by ear. So how, it, it's like, a long would you time. write it down or would you just like learn it by mm-hmm. ear and then sing it or what? I'd write it down. So just like try and hear a phrase and, you know, not touch an instrument and then just like write it out and wow. then keep going. And yeah took a long time <laughs> so that one's still very special to me because it, it just impacted me a lot um ooh, let's see yes yeah, so we have interstellar space crescent oh man i don't know there are so many that's those two are the ones that are kind of on heavy rotation oh coltrane quartet plays like the one that has like chim chim tree and like ooh, yeah 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 um yeah that's that, a great that album. one's have that one on vinyl sitting around somewhere so that's in pretty heavy rotation that's awesome i see you also when i was looking at your bookcase you have a train on train that's probably one of my favorite coltrane books oh yeah like coltrane interviews and stuff yeah the thing i love about it is it's, it's just i mean yeah i guess they compiled every interview he had ever done yeah and put it in weird. chronological order so that's profound too because then you yeah. really like you go through the uh the interviews and you go through his periods of of music like for me learning uh you know jazz at the university was like it was cool but it was like really like the time that i would spend at home like reading the biographies mm-hmm. and then with the biographies like making it not just a story of their life chronologically but then also listen to the cds as they talked about them right like the miles famous book with quincy troop it was like i remember mm-hmm. listening to it and like at the point of spe- uh, sketches of spain listening to it and just being like wow you know just yeah. like the Completely. full movie you know mm-hmm. what i mean of absolutely their experience and yeah the thing about that Coltrane book that was, it's just so nice to hear everything in his voice. I mean, biographies are great too, but Mm -hmm. it's, you get a lot of like opinions about someone's life and like, and Coltrane did this because of blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. You get the author's interpretation of, which, you know, can be useful, but (laughs) can also get in the way. Yeah, totally. So it's just purely, that's what I love about that book. And also notes and tones. I don't know if you've read that one. No, that's such a cool train? No, it's a, what is Art it? Taylor interviewed a bunch of uh, musicians. I forget when he did these, like maybe in the 60s or maybe later, actually. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and it's just he interviews Miles and like Ron, and Don Bias, like a, I don't know, a bunch of cats. But they're, they're talking to him like a friend because they're all friends. Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. So it's really... From um, a different, totally different perspective. Yeah, it's right? not like how you talk to a journalist necessarily. Like everybody really opens up and I don't know, I was talking to Vijay about this one time and he's like, I think that's one of the greatest books on music, like wow. period. But, yeah. Notes and directions. Notes and tones. Notes and tones. Yeah. I'm going to look that up. Yeah, bro. yeah. Wow. Hmm. There's so many great books out there about, I mean, about different artists throughout their lives, but you're right. It's like you do get that filtered view of like you know mm-hmm. it's almost why like i i could never ever finish a Jimi hendrix biography it was like everyone that I'd right. read it was just like there's one that i'm reading right now that's called the uh, uh room full of mirrors i think it's called uh. really great one but it's like so I, what i love about it is that it's so in depth it's more like uh, mm-hmm. like this guy's research truly into his life of like where he went to middle school and what oh, issues wow. he had is like that eventually made him write you know castles made of sand and like, mm-hmm. you know it's 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 that that type of like biography is really cool because then you see kind of like uh, or you would imagine you would hope that that's like the honest perspective as to like what their trajectory was mm-hmm. but when you get someone's friend like you know interviewing them you're right it's a yeah. whole different story yeah well, i would love to read that hmm. hendrix book I, I read one biography of his when about him when i was yeah 13 or 14 or something some book like this i was super Jimi Hendrix obsessed. Really? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> when, when you were like, like, yeah, teens like that or age, 20? yeah, like teenager. Nice. Yeah. That was my shit, bro. That, mm-hmm. That's the reason, truly, 
Jimi Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan are the two reasons why I definitely love guitar and like was like, I want to be a guitarist. And right, yeah, yeah I can understand. Still <laughs> to this day, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, that definitely got me like deeper into the the blues and like and checking out like where Hendrix came from and like the cats he was listening to and like definitely got me more like uh, got me like deeper into the history of like all the cats that were great blues guitar players and singers totally, and man. Stuff. Yeah. totally. I remember someone you know I, I always thought at least in those first couple of years when I got into Jimmy and Stevie Vaughan that Stevie Ray Vaughan's biggest influence was Jimi Hendrix because mm-hmm. the rumors were that like he played exactly like Jimi Hendrix but then someone was like no bro you're wrong go mm-hmm. listen to Freddie King and I was like what were you talking right. about and then, not excuse me, not Freddie King. How rude of me, Albert King. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, and the experience of like listening to someone that plays exact like the lines of Steve Ray Vaughan was just right, like, right. oh shit, no, that's where it came from. Like, probably seventy percent right. more from him than it was Jimmy. Even though Jimmy obviously, you know, affected every guitar player and every musician. Right. You know. Plus, yeah, there's a whole like Texas guitar like blues tradition, like oh Lightning gosh. Hopkins and like, all these cats. So, yes. Yeah. So if you could have played an instrument besides the bass, still, Ooh, yeah, what that's instrument hard. do you think it would be? <laughs> I, I initially wanted to play drums like mm. when I was a kid. I think when I was still in diapers, like I had a little practice pad, and my dad would invite like his drummer friends over, and like I would learn little rudiments and stuff nice. like that. You know? yeah. But I, I never got, I never really got good at it, but. Um, I mean, I never like got a drum set or anything. Right, right, right. Um, but initially, I was drawn to the drums, and then I went to Interlochen during the summer because my dad was teaching there because it's also a summer camp. Hmm. Um, was that your in through your dad? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's how we were able to. I mean, I got some scholarship to go there for high school, but also because of my dad teaching there, that was automatically like half off the cost of you know it's that's awesome it's boarding school it's not (laughs) really expensive yeah Yeah, yeah. (laughs) um but yeah during the summer i i took some class well interlocken back then it was eight weeks long like during the summer so Mm -hmm. the first four weeks i took this class called instrumental exploration where you go through like okay week one you play all the woodwinds and like week two, you play all the brass instruments and then strings and then percussion. Yeah. And then you pick which instrument you want. And then, I don't know, I was really, really drawn to the bass. And mm. apparently to the point where I just bugged my dad every night to like take me back to the room where they had like instrument storage where all the basses were and wow. stuff. And like, please. Like, um, <laughs> but I was kind of deciding. I also really liked saxophone and I really liked cello. But I kind of... I remember wanting to be able to play jazz and classical music. And I was like, well, bass kind of seems to make the most sense, mm-hmm. being able to do both those things. Um, yeah. Did you play classical like a bit outside mm-hmm. of like uh, the inner like Julia? Like, I'm sure you played in the ensembles and stuff like that, but like right. outside in the professional world, did you ever like do some symphony or, you know? No, I world? never did any professional. I mean, I'm just, you know. I'm not as good at it. No, no, sure. <laughs> uh, really not. But I still study it all the time. I mean, yeah. uh, the still like the Bach cello suites are still a huge part of my practice, and they have been since I was 15 or something. But hmm. um, a lot of the other solo bass repertoire is not my favorite music in the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, some yeah, of sure. it's great, I mean, but a lot of it's kind of I don't know. It's easy for me to practice Bach like all day long. Um, yeah. How much do you think um, playing classical music, or really just even more so classical music, playing with a bow, helped your intonation? I should, yeah, it helps a huge amount. Um, I talk with bassists about this often because I'm like, there's some young bassists that I play with uh, in Albuquerque a lot. And mm-hmm. They're like, they love the electric bass, they love some funk stuff, they love mm-hmm. all this, and then they're like starting to play upright, and I'm like, yeah, it's awesome, but like gotta spend time with that upright and like right. get that bow out because you'll realize how out of tune you are man. right it's yeah that's one of the hardest things to do on the upright bass like really play in tune like yeah. i'm still working on that all the time <laughs> right, um, right, right. but i mean classical teachers will also like hook up your left hand and just uh just dealing with getting a good position and i mean that also really helps intonation so mm. 
the yeah i mean when i was at juilliard i didn't really play in any of the classical ensembles but i remember taking like one lesson from the principal of the phil like this guy eugene levinson hmm. this old school like russian dude like super hardcore <laughs> uh, I mean, he was great like I, I played some bach for him and he was like yeah you play pretty in tune but you don't really have a sound <laughs> and i was like yeah that's totally true wow. uh, so we yeah. worked on some bow stuff and then he totally hooked up my left hand and showed me some things and yeah i gotta say that is probably the number one thing that hooked up my intonation but hmm. that and ear training because you sort of also have to be able to hear and <laughs> sure, <laughs> to be able to sure. play in tune <laughs> Um, and bass is unique in that like for me the hardest stuff to really tune is like the E string like stuff in the really in the low register I feel like people don't always hear in that register very clearly I know for me I didn't I had to like really work on like can I actually hear this low and hear if it's in tune or not like you know absolutely man I remember like I remember, you know, when I was first getting into music and going to see Ahmad Jamal come to Pope Joy and play. Oh, wow. And I like, it was like, one, not the first, but one of the first times that I remember seeing on a bright bass. And mm. it was like, I couldn't hear that frequency. Yeah, yeah. Like, I remember just seeing the concert and being like, what is that guy doing on stage? Like, yeah. what is he, I can't hear what he's doing, you know? <laughs> Even when he take a solo, like mm. I could, you, and I don't know what it is. It's like your, your ears got to eventually tune down to like hear yeah. that yeah, low stuff, you know? <laughs> Now, when did electric bass come into the picture? Did it right um, away? Or no, was it? it was a, well, I wanted one kind of right away, but mm -hmm. I remember asking my parents for one, and my dad was like, well, you have to learn all your major and minor scales in 12 keys, and then we'll get you an electric bass. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. Um, so, and I still remember exactly how that felt. I thought that was like an insurmountable task. I was like, no, I'll never, Impossible, I'll right? never learn all my major and minor scales. It's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but eventually I did like, and of course, like I was super into Jocko. Yeah. So the first yeah. bass I got was this kind of like shitty PV fretless bass. It actually still kind of has a vibe. I, I, <laughs> you still um, have it? <laughs> yeah, well, my little brother has it. I didn't even know you had a little brother. Yeah, a little really? half brother. Yeah, my dad remarried. And, awesome. Yeah, he's just a half brother. No yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have an older sister, half sister. Oh. Um, Are they musicians? Uh, I know you. My little brother is. He, has he his yeah, he plays bass and saxophone. Tight. Um, so yeah, he has that that bass fretless bass. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, electric definitely came later, and it's. It's still, I love the electric bass, but um, it still sort of feels like a second instrument in a way. Mm. It's, mm. it's it's really different. You you can't just be an upright player and like expect to play electric bass and sound good. <laughs> <You know>? uh, <laughs> yeah. Certain things are easier, but like, I mean, I'm still working on getting my sound together. But that was that was the main thing, like really being able to get a sound out of the electric bass that yes, right felt good and like um i mean it takes a lot of work you know. hmm. Hmm. now from electric bass from upright bass like uh, what role did composition play in your life growing up were you writing early on yeah kind of i mean i think i started writing like little simple tunes when i was i don't know maybe 15 or something like this hmm. um and uh, going to Interlochen, I had friends that were composers, like classical composers and stuff. So hmm. I, I was hanging with them and um, definitely learned a lot. Uh, and yeah, I mean, also, you know, my dad having his doctorate in composition and stuff like composing. I always, yeah, I was drawn to it and I feel like it's helped me progress as a musician a hmm. lot. Um, I, I never f feel more accomplished than when like I finish writing a tune and it actually comes oh together and it actually sounds good. It feels yeah. like, wow. Cause there's a, <laughs> you know, playing the bass, like playing a gig can feel so uh, fleeting. Like you just play the notes, you play the concert and it's gone. <laughs> like yeah. finishing a con like 
a piece of music and like looking at this concrete thing. <laughs> it's like, wow, I created this thing. Um, there was another sense of satisfaction with oh that. Oh my God, yeah. And like then jumping off the roof and be like, I just wrote this song. Yeah, yeah. I know, exactly. <laughs> um, and also for me, I, for some reason, I don't know, my tunes, I don't feel super comfortable like improvising on them all the time. <laughs> uh, I usually write them on guitar or piano and sometimes I end up writing harmony that I then have to be like, oh man, how do I play over this? Like, <laughs> I feel like I have to <laughs> teach myself how to play uh, my own compositions. But I feel like there's a lot of growth in that, in like writing things that are a little above you and then That's <laughs> having awesome. to like, yeah. Totally, man. I, I, I have that feeling on a couple of my songs on, on my first record. It's like I, I play on them and I was like, Dang, that solo is terrible. If I could do that again, it's like, you know, not to say it's terrible, but it's just like, you know, with the harmony and with the way that you would hear the song as someone that didn't write the song, you're like, mm. there's a lot of stuff happening there harmonically that you could have hit on that you didn't hit on, right? Right. So. Yeah, I know that feeling. And mm. also, like, I'm a really not good guitar player. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I'm not so great at the piano. So I feel like a lot of the harmony that happens is like a mistake so <laughs> like, i come across a voicing i really like and then i have to figure out like oh, what was that and then i kind of start to shape it and it starts to make sense and yeah so it starts out pretty intuitive and then i have to go through the process of <laughs> trying to organize it and have it make sense yeah <laughs> do you ever feel like you write a chord out or you think you wrote a chord out and then someone else will come by and play that chord and they're like no nah, this isn't what you meant i think what you meant was this uh yeah I do. I mean, a lot of times I've, like, I've just kind of given up on chord symbols when when they don't make sense. So. You just write out the notes? <laughs> yeah, because some, I think there's some compositions of mine where the voicing doesn't really fit into the like, common jazz nomenclature. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of limitations to what that can express. It's sort of a weird way to view harmony, actually. But um, hmm. so... Hmm. A lot of times I'll write out a chord symbol for people just to make it easier, but... Um, what you really mean is the voicing. Right? Yeah. So if I write a voicing, some people are great with that. Like if I bring uh, like a new tune to like Aaron Parks, for instance, mm -hmm. like we've been friends forever. So if I bring it him something and he looks at a voicing, like it's kind of instantly he sort of digests it and gets a sense of the harmony and plays it. I'm gotcha. like, yes, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not everybody likes to think that way. So, right. Um, yeah. But that's something that Greg Osby used to, that's kind of the first place I saw that. Like when I joined his band, all the harmony was just like a four note voicing. Hmm. So there'd be a measure and there weren't any chord symbols. It'd be like these notes. And it's like, you can write what you think the chord is if you want, but it's not really the full picture. <laughs> it's like, Just make uh, sure you play those notes. Right? Yeah. Or, you know, notes that work with the sound of those four, you know. Totally. No, totally. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. This uh, this bass player back home, uh, you might know him, Arthur Metter. He's an amazing electric bassist. He, mm -hmm. uh, he writes a lot of songs that way. He's just like, it's just his voicing. So every time I play this song, I just stick with the one voicing I know right. that is like, could be this or could be this, but really I know if I just play these notes like that, mm -hmm. it'll make him happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you're about to go into the studio next week to yeah. record your third album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about it, man. What's uh, what's the inspiration for putting out your third record? Because you put out your second one two years ago? How yeah. Um, I don't know. It feels like it's time, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep stuff moving. Um, yes. But also the uh, Jerry Teakins, like the guy who runs Criss Cross, just emailed me and he's like, hey, do you want to do another record? And I was like... Yeah, I guess I should. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was part of the inspiration. But also, yeah. <laughs> the past couple of years, I've been doing some trio gigs with um, the great drummer Damian Reed and mm. amazing tenor player Mark Shim. Mm. And yeah, we did quite a few gigs last year, and but we never really documented any of it. So uh, when Jerry asked me to do another record, I was like, well, yeah, might as well document that stuff. Like those guys sound so incredible yeah um so yeah right now i'm like in the process of finishing that notebook right there it's like <laughs> I was trying to finish the tune and get it you know make charts by i think today's saturday so 
rehearsals Monday, so. <laughs> Get them by Sunday night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me happy to know most musicians do the same type of thing, right? It's like, going to the studio, when are we going to get the album? When are we going to get the guitar, bro? You'll see it like the night before, bro. It'll yeah. Good, bro. <laughs> I've said the most of the stuff. But yeah, there's still, I'm like, man, I need to write some more music. Yeah. So you send them recordings or what do you send them? Um, well, some of it we've played. Ah. And yeah, other stuff, it's just like Sibelius files or something. You know? Got you. So. so when you write, are you mostly writing on the computer or do you write by hand, uh, like notation stuff? A lot of times it starts by hand because um, if I'm just at the piano or something, like trying to jot down ideas, the computer feels funny. I don't know. Gets <laughs> it, in the way. Yeah, it kind of just feels like this barrier. It feels kind of artificial or something. There's mm. still something that feels more direct about like playing something on the piano and then taking a pen and putting it to paper. Yes. And then I love that. Later, I'll put it in the computer just so people can read it. But mm. um, I know a lot of people prefer handwritten charts, and that it makes total sense. It's yeah. just, I think I'm too lazy to do, <laughs> but also my handwriting is really bad. <laughs> Got you. I definitely think that uh, that when you write out a chart, it's like you've got this connection with it. And you're almost mm -hmm. like, I feel like they're going to know what I want more. But really then, whenever the bass player or the, the piano player is just like, hey, bro, like, let me write these charts out for you. You're like, oh, shit, maybe I just need to <laughs> right. yeah. sit down at the computer and do this correctly. You know? Yeah. Well, I remember talking to Mark Turner about it. I'd, or it just came up and he's like, yeah, I prefer handwritten charts. Mm. Like, yeah. But it's true. It does kind of get you to the spirit of somebody's music in a certain way. It, like seeing, it has know. to write. I think Maria yeah. Schneider talked in an interview about that too. It's like she writes out most of her charts for oh, the orchestra, which wow. is fucking crazy. You know? Crazy. There's a lot of writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gonzalo does that too. Really? For, yeah. Any of the records I've ever done, mm. it's, it's everything by hand. Um, yeah, and some of it is pretty complicated music, and he's just like oh, in the studio. If he has to make a correction, he has a little whiteout pen and he'll like <laughs> white and then write over it. And, wow! Yeah. Now you you've been playing with Gonzalo for many years now, right? Yeah, like over ten years, I think. How'd you all meet? He saw me play at the Village Vanguard. Um, I think I was playing there with Greg Osby, mm -hmm. and. At the time, they were both on Blue Note Records, and I think Gonzalo was in the office, and he was like looking for a bass player, I guess. And somebody was like, "Oh, you should go down to the Vanguard. Like Osby is playing, and like there's this young kid. Like maybe you like him." And then, so I remember being on stage and like seeing the door open and seeing Gonzalo walk in, and I was like, "Oh shit!" You knew, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew it was him. I was like, "What is he doing here?" Um, and I didn't meet him that night or anything, but mm. then like a couple of weeks later, like, his manager emailed me and then we got together and, uh, rehearsed and like did a tour and made a record. And so, yeah, since then we've played off and on. Yeah. For the past, like, I think 11 years, 11 or 12, I think I was 23 when I started playing with him. Wow. Yeah. And how old are you now, Matt? 35. 35. Yeah. Hmm. So you you were also we were talking about before the podcast started about your trip down to Cuba with mm -hmm. Gonzalo. Yeah, uh, tell me a little bit about that, man. When was that? A couple that years was ago, right? oh man, I'm really Six, bad with dates. Ago, yeah, something like that. Uh, <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah, kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, it was definitely before relations had it all normalized. It was before like yes, President Obama had um, made things a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, that trip changed my life I think <laughs> hmm. I mean musically it really like opened up so many things for me um how long were y'all there just one week but yeah, so much happened in that week it was crazy um I mean just playing with Gonzalo has really like informed me as a musician like changed certain things by how I think about music hmm. but um going to Cuba and meeting all these cats like we met changuito who i know you know <laughs> and like the, the first thing when i met him somebody introduced me and i was just like maestro like it's such an honor to meet you but and he just like instantly like shut all that down and he was like okay and then he started tapping like clave in one hand and then this like rhythm in five in his other hand and he was like like 
can you, yeah, can you do it? Oh, and it was like shit. me and Marcus Gilmore and Pedro, uh, Pedro Martinez. And they both like got it. And, yeah. and I was just sitting there like, <laughs> um, and let's see, I mean, Pedro really made that trip amazing. He, every day we would go to his family's uh, apartment and everybody was super generous. We'd have food and mm. like hang out and like, later in the night we just like drink rum hang <laughs> go here i mean i would pedro doesn't drink i don't think but yeah. um and he had a roomba one night at his apartment and so all these people came over and like brought drums and everybody started playing and singing and dancing and then like out of nowhere this greyhound bus like pulls up and, like right in front of his apartment and like the door opens and then all of like Los Muñequitos de Matanzas came out what? and like, <laughs> and they just like, it was incredible. They walked into the party and then also just started playing and wow. singing. And like, it was incredible. I couldn't believe it. I was just like <laughs> sitting in this room with like <laughs> one of the baddest groups, so, you know, um, and I have some, I recorded some of that. It's somewhere. Wow. So, and then we, uh, like I was saying, I I bought a set of bata drums and mm. like brought those back to the states. And I've been studying. The first lesson was with with Pedro. He like he gave me and Marcus like a little lesson. Um, but we went to his godfather's house, the guy that taught him bata, mm. and they played um, elegua for us, which is I mean it's the orisha that begins every ceremony. So you play elegua, and that opens the way for all the other. Uh, I guess for the rest of the ceremony. But so they played just that first part and me and Marcus were sitting down on the couch and I remember like standing up and feeling like I could barely stand like something. I don't know. I've never really experienced anything like that. It was wow. just like, I felt like dizzy. Um, and then his godfather took us back into the room where he keeps all like the ceremonial drums, which you'd only play for like, you know, uh, for the religious ceremonies and then he like said a prayer for us and then yeah and we went on our way and <laughs> so there were just amazing experiences like that it was just yeah I'll, I'll never forget I dream of going to Cuba man I, oh you you have to go yes you'd be amazed I how much like there's just music everywhere it's it was, you know, I remember I had a, an interesting first meeting with Changuito too. It, was, it wasn't, I mean, like the first time I met him, it was like I, you know, shook his hand and he came out and uh, was listening to the rehearsal of the Cuban band that I was playing with that had brought him out to stay with them in their house. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I met him and he was in his, you know, he was in long johns. He was just like wearing like underwear type, you know, get yeah. up <laughs> and smoking a cigar. And I'm just like, hey, okay, wait well. Bueno. And then he like went back to his room and was just like chilling in the room, smoking in there and just like listening to the rehearsal from his room. Mm -hmm. And then he came out, you know, after one of the songs and was just like, me gusta, eso está bueno, like, this is all right, you know. And, nice. then, and then eventually they brought him out uh, like the next time for a rehearsal. And like, you know, we'd had a couple of words exchanged between the two of us. But for the rehearsal, when he came out and played, he was playing timbales. And mm -hmm. I was telling you, my friend Brian was playing like the six bata setup that he had. Mm -hmm. And Changuito took a solo and it was like, he stared like not just at me, but like through my soul. It was just right. like <laughs> singing every note that he was playing. Like, listen, I'm giving you it right here. You know, right. just like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, it's so incredible. It's amazing, man. And he also, yeah, he gave Marcus a, drum set lesson while we were there wow. and i have that recorded somewhere too it's hmm. like that's man yeah it was really heavy it's a powerful experience being around cubans man especially with the religious music mm -hmm. i mean it's something really very powerful and very uh like there's a lot of gravity in it you know like what you're talking about with uh, the experience of feeling the music and feeling like dizzy when you get up mm -hmm. like it's yeah. trans music in some ways, you yeah. know? And, like, I, I've listened to a couple CDs of, like, Sanctero music, which is just all percussion like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's powerful shit, man. Yeah, you it know? really is. For some reason, I don't know, I've always, from the first time I heard it, I was really, really drawn to it. And, um, yes, the, the more I've studied Bata, like, it's definitely made me a better musician. Like, mm. 
yeah, in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> so, from playing with Gonzalo and traveling to Cuba, I mean, what's uh, what's been your other experience with Latin, with Latin music? I mean, do you play much Latin music besides not playing with Gonzalo? Really? Not really. I mean, not as much as I would like. I mean, I don't play any just like straight up Solid salsa or gigs. Like or, right, right. Um, but I, well, last year I played a gig with a great Cuban piano player, David Vareas. Hmm. I don't know if you know David. I don't know. He's, I don't. yeah, super. He's unbelievably great musician and i think it's around my age did you do it on upright or on electric mm -hmm. then on upright and uh, david's music is really difficult to explain but this gig was just dance on like we we're just playing dance songs wow. and uh i think it was just like percussion piano uh bass maybe saxophone um and We played some, like some of Cachao's music, like some early dansons, and then David wrote some dansons. But his music has like this really like 20th century like harmonic, like I don't know. It's really like it just sounds like 20th century classical music, like the in danson form. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's not really doing it justice, but that gives you some kind of idea. It's like it's. Yeah, it was really incredible. So that was a great experience. It's awesome. Um, yeah, well, no, I've played quite a few gigs with Yosfani Terry. And, you know, that his music is kind of bridging, like, aspects of Cuban music and jazz. Hmm. Um, so we've, I remember a long time ago we played a gig with like three Mata players and Yosvani and me and piano. Wow. And that was before I really knew anything about Cuban music. Mm. And, <laughs> um, but that experience also kind of made me really want to get more into it. Cause I was like, this feels incredible. Like I need to like get more of this somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So over the years, it's mostly been playing with like Yosvani or a great trumpet player, Mike Rodriguez, Um, his dad's Cuban and you know he knows that music really well also mm. um, so yeah I haven't played really a lot of like traditional just straight up like Cuban music yeah, but yeah, yeah. I've played in situations where there's a lot of influence of that right? yeah, yeah, yeah it's awesome man yeah. so tell me about the new record man I mean you're gonna be playing with the trio mm -hmm. is it all your original music you knew any covers I think we'll do a few covers. Um, there's, yeah, there's, there's, I haven't decided. Sure, I know you. I know <laughs> there's you a wanna, tune, there's some the stuff on this uh, Ornette Coleman record, Ornette on Tenor. Do you hmm. know that record? No, I don't know that record. Man, it's super bad. Ornette it, on Tenor. Yeah, it's, it's Ornette on Tenor <laughs> and Don Cherry <laughs> and um, Jimmy Garrison and Ed Blackwell. Oh, wow. Like, man there's some great stuff on there so hmm. i think maybe well, i'm thinking of transcribing one of those tunes tomorrow sweet <laughs> man then bringing it in um i feel like that music lends itself really well to playing in a format where we don't have a chordal instrument hmm. um hmm. and then yeah some of my music maybe a tune of marks and then there's this album that i really love that's just um Dewey Redman and Ed Blackwell playing duo. It's this live Whoa. duo concert. Okay. Um, and the first tune on that record, I think it's just called Willis Hour or something. Um, I think we'll do that. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Sounds mm -hmm. awesome. Now, your other records are mostly your original music. Now, fill me in because I've heard a little bit of the album that came out two years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's all original music except for, I think, a blues maybe. Mm -hmm. And then... No, I think there's also a Bill Frizzell tune on there. Nice. Um, and yeah, the rest of that is just tunes of mine. Um, most of them were written for that record, but a couple of them were kind of older songs that I hadn't gotten a chance to record yet. Um, which, yeah, I still have quite a few things that I wrote a long time ago that haven't been recorded. So we'll see. One of those might end up on the new record also. Awesome. <laughs> Do you revise tunes over time? Like, do you like write tunes that you 
then play later and you're like, oh, I'm going to change this about it. Yeah, but I'm, I've, I mean, done, I've done that a bit. But yeah, yeah, mostly, no, they tend to kind of stay how they are for mm-hmm. the most part. Once you finish it. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. I know once it's recorded, then it's in the form. You know what I mean? But like right. a song maybe say that you haven't recorded or something like that that you wrote from years ago that now you're like, now I'm going to play but maybe in three instead of four. Or right. Something like that. You know? I should. Yeah, I don't. They're, I would definitely be open to that. I, I don't feel like they're set in stone and they have to be, they're, just, they're not like sacred. They, right, right. You, know, <laughs> right. I could, you broke the rule. You played a B <laughs> where you should have played an E. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, definitely if somebody in the band has an idea, well, yeah, great. I think the way I play them changes more than the tunes themselves, I guess. I see, yeah. <laughs> or yeah, the yeah. way each band interprets it, right? Yeah. I try not to give too much direction and because I know I have an idea in my head of like what the drums are kind of supposed to do and like what everybody's roles are supposed to be. Right. And I try to just never tell anybody those things. Really? I mean, yeah. You I'm, just hire the right cats. Yeah. And let then, take care of I mean, something. a lot of times, especially with the drums, it's like they'll end up doing something that I would have never thought of. Because um, mm-hmm. I feel like people give drummers the most direction but it's usually the instrument people know the least about like (laughs) (laughs) awesome yeah Yeah, i don't know people are always like oh can you just play like on the hi-hat in this section and then we go over here and can you play like some elven stuff (laughs) (laughs) man like can you play drums at all probably not (laughs) i don't know people are always picking on drummers It's, it's frustrating to me um, so, awesome. I, I mean, sometimes it'll be a basic idea of like, I kind of was thinking of this feel. And then a lot of times if it's, I mean, it's, I'm going to call people that I admire. So then they're, <laughs> they're going to do something that I'm like, man, I would have never thought of that. Yeah. Like, yeah awesome. Yeah, totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. It's definitely like a balance of like, I mean, not necessarily like direction, but of just like the cats and hoping that what you hear in your head is definitely going to like flourish into something way more beautiful, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that's just my approach because my music doesn't have anything so specific in the drum part. Like if I were writing drum parts, like sure. a Steve <laughs> Coleman or somebody, like it definitely works for Steve's music. Is Steve like that? Is Steve pretty precise about every, every part that he wants from everyone? Yeah. I mean, I think he wants you to, I mean, from the gigs that I've done, there's always... I mean, there's a drum chant that's at like the center mm. of what the music is, mm. and then the drummer kind of plays it, and then maybe plays around it, but it's still mm. kind of always there. And then, um, but it really, really works for his music, and his music needs that, and it's kind of built around that. Um, so yeah, and then other parts might be in a different meter, and then it just takes a few cycles for everything to kind of line up. Right. Um, but yeah. Do you play with other people that have incredible like 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 images in their head of what they want the music and they give direction like that? Or is it I not? I think a, so. I mean other people that I think have been pretty influenced by Steve, like hmm. um, like gigs I've done with Vijay Iyer. Mm-hmm. Like it's the same. There's usually a drum part that uh, you know, the drummer can interpret, but it's still like pretty essential. Um yeah, I think well, those are the two main examples I can <laughs> think of that where there's a real like drum chant that has to happen. Wow. Yeah. Now, how did you get linked up with Crisscross, your record label? Um, I think just from being on other people's records on the label. Mm-hmm. And then um yeah, my friend Aaron Parks was talking to Jerry and the uh label guy mm-hmm. and he I was just telling him, oh, you really need to hear Matt's music. Like, um, Aaron's always been great about that. He's always been like kind of championing my music. <laughs> um, you know, among, you know, he's always helped me out with like, he's like, oh, you should hear Matt's music. Um, so he was talking to Jerry and then, uh, I mean, yeah, eventually Jerry wrote me an email and yeah, then we hooked up the first record. And then since then, yeah, every year or so he's like, called me and asked me to do something like we were going to do something last year but I wasn't really ready to do it and mm. so it's awesome man yeah do you see yourself staying in New York for a long time 
I do. I, I really like it here. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I left briefly in like 2010. I, I remember. I came back to New yeah. Mexico. Um, were you living just outside of Santa Fe? Or where were yeah, you in like well, a tiny little town, Rio and Medio, like outside <laughs> Tezuke. Yeah. It's gorgeous out there. Um, you got into some really cool stuff out there, making your own bread. Oh man, we beer. were like making, <laughs> like living next to these farmers, and we were like milking goats in the morning. What? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I know. It was me and my girlfriend at the time, Isla. You know, Isla Cantor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's a great guitar player and musician. Too. Yeah, uh, we're still really good friends and stuff. But, um, awesome, man. So yeah, and we were living very close to Bruce Dunlap, who is an incredible guitar player. Like. Super underrated. Oh my cat, god! So bad, man. I like. I don't know anybody that can do what he does on on the instrument. Like, Seriously, he's really, like man. singular cat. But he just doesn't. You know, he's just out there living in a tiny house. I think like he's <laughs> he's just chilling. <laughs> Is but, he a tiny house guy? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he got into that when I was out there. That's cool. Um, he has a big house too, though. Or he just now he, he just did, only. But has I don't think. I think he only has the tiny house. I mean, he has the performance space in Santa Fe. Yeah, so I think gig performance space, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I think he practices there. And, um, yeah, we played a lot of duo gigs when, when I was living out there. But that was just like a 10-month like stint. I would kind of sort of been fed up with certain aspects of New York. Um, and then going out there kind of like cleansed me of those things. And <laughs> ever since I've been back, I've been kind of like really in love with New York. And it's it stayed like that. For, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So what was the breaking point of leaving New Mexico? Was it just like the, the traveling to the airport was too much? <laughs> <laughs> that was fine. I mean, it was such a beautiful drive. I, would I, you always go to Santa Fe Airport and fly to there? Or would you fly to Albuquerque? Yeah, mostly place? Albuquerque. It's the drive, though, is like an hour and 15. It is. 20. Yeah, it's <laughs> not. Just getting to Santa Fe, it was like 30 minutes, I think. Yeah. From, from, you know, from where you live. Way um, out in the woods where and you were in the other direction of albuquerque right you went towards albuquerque right yeah yeah i was like north of santa fe um so yeah that wasn't fun but <laughs> <laughs> and getting to europe is you know it's just further from new mexico right. but mostly it was just I, I don't know i missed the like the grind of like sure being around a ton of musicians all the time and also like having like heated arguments about stuff like <laughs> really <laughs> a bit like, or just like intense conversations about music like um I, that didn't happen so much because it's just a smaller scene in, in new mexico sure yeah yeah so there's like in new york there's such a concentration of people and like of ideas and it's for me it's i think i don't have the self-discipline to be in an isolated place and really keep growing. Some musicians totally thrive in that environment. And right. for me, I, I kind of need the pressure of like, all right, you have a gig tonight. Like you better practice. Like, <laughs> yeah. This person sent you this music. You better get it together. Like, <laughs> yes, I have to have that kind of outside pressure. So I sort of need New York or a place like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty like, it's a, it's a totally different, not just pace of life, but like what you're talking about, the experience of uh, of going from being surrounded by the grind and by other people who you share ideas with, and then all of a sudden just being like stuck with your own ideas, mm -hmm. <laughs> being like, oh shit, I got to get out of this room, man. I haven't right. seen the daylight today or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and New Mexico is so chill. It's like, it's such a beautiful, I still think it's like one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It's, mm. it's such an incredible place. Yeah. Um, maybe someday. I don't know. I could see myself potentially retiring there, but yeah. Um, but also, my girlfriend was born in Hawaii, and it's like, mm. yeah, and that's also like <laughs> one of the most beautiful places ever. Total paradise. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Living on volcanoes. <laughs> Man, I could see <laughs> doing that too, but <laughs> it's not anytime soon because mm. I still need that. That grind and that yeah. work, yeah. This is also how you make your living. So, of course, yeah, you know, well, there's helps. that too. Yeah, <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> Staying where the work is and where the demand is. Mm -hmm. So, you were you were playing the other night at New Blue, man, mm -hmm. and y'all sounded amazing. It was Aaron's music for Little Big. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he said an album's going to come out in a month and a half. Right. I'm guessing you didn't record on the album if you had only just started no, learning no, no, the music no. before. Yeah, that's the first time I'd played 
most of that music, almost all of it. And one of them is an older song that I had played before, but yeah, that's, I think it's going to be a really good record for Aaron. Cause I, I think it's the logical, like next album for him. Mm. Like that's, kind of similar to invisible cinema in it's like in direction but i think it's like you know it's 10 years later so right he's is that the last matured. album that he put out no he's put out a he put out a solo piano record on ecm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i believe a trio record too hmm. and um but I, yeah i think I don't know. I'm I'm just very excited for Aaron. I I really like the new music, and I think it's going to be a very like important and good record for him. That's awesome. Um, I remember Invisible Cinema. That's the last, or that's the only really Aaron Parks record I know. Right. And I've heard a lot. I love that album. Yeah, that's funny. A lot of when I've done gigs with Aaron, like people still like come up to him all the time be like oh invisible cinema like that record yeah. changed my life <laughs> yeah <laughs> people yeah um i remember when he like put that album out 10 years ago or however many years ago it was and like i was following him on facebook or on something back then and he mm-hmm. like posted one of his friends who was a school teacher and how she had played invisible cinema for all our kids oh, and wow. then had them all draw pictures of what they thought of mm-hmm. or what oh, they cool. felt right yeah yeah it was like i was like Wow, this is so cool, man. I remember back then just even thinking about the relationship of like of synesthesia, mm-hmm. of listening to some art form and then expressing it in some other art form. Yeah, yeah. And uh aside, I mean even the words, you know, totally mm-hmm. describe that. Yeah. What music can be. Definitely. I don't know if that was his intention or not with well, the album not, title, but yeah, I don't I'm not sure either. But I think well, I think he was thinking that the the music evoked some kind of cinematic quality. Totally. Um Oh, yeah, that's definitely in there. It's powerful, man. Yeah. Now, the, who is the guitar player's name again? Greg Tui. Man, so lyrical, bro. I love his yeah, playing, man. Me too. Yeah. It was great, like, sound world. and Totally, like, man. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was like, you know, when I was seeing him do all this stuff on, on like, you know, on Aaron Solo, like, the guitar player in me was thinking, like, no, man, don't comp behind the piano player solo. But then I was, like, listening to what he was doing. I was like, holy shit, like. Fuck, like that's like the same time. Like, like it's just like it fits so beautifully in the sonic world of everything that was right. being done by the roads and the you know mm-hmm. the setup that he had. Yeah, then I mean that's one thing I know about Aaron too. Like he likes piano and guitar comping together, mm-hmm. and it's it does seem like one of those things that's always like taboo. Like oh, like you can't ever comp together guitar and piano. Right, it's like right. this weird ad- adversarial relationship. Totally. Um, totally. But it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, you can. It can work. <laughs> you can't like, play in peace and harmony, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, don't do the same stuff that each other, like, you know, yeah. maybe if, if you're both playing super dense chords in the same register, that might not sound right, good. Right, but right, like, right. You know, but even more like just like being a guitar player and like using the guitar effect and like the whammy bar a lot, which is something I love, man. Mm-hmm. John Maestro has that same guitar that he has, that jazz master, and he's been using the whammy bar so much. And it's just like, yeah an expressive tool that guitar players have, but in the jazz world, we almost don't use as like taboo to bend or oh, to I know, do that yeah. kind of stuff. Totally. Know? I mean, yeah, it is funny. Uh, I mean, I'm a huge like Holdsworth fan. Really? So, yeah. I saw the book over yeah, there. You see the book. The practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Are you shedding that on bass or on guitar? I, I, there was a tune in there that I really loved and I just wanted to like, check out what the harmony was a little better so Sick. i'm just playing it on piano mostly oh, nice. i guess some of those chords i can't really figure out on guitar no, I, <laughs> i've tried i mean i i went through slowly and yeah. like got some of it but it's also easier for me to conceptualize in a theoretical way if i do it on the piano so mm-hmm. if i look at a typical like voicing that he might use and i can think oh wow like it, i don't know it makes more sense if i see it on the piano sure sure for me but yeah, I mean, so that's I like also what Greg was doing with the whammy bar and like the, the expressive expressiveness he gets and the sounds that he gets. Yeah, and it's man. I think he's I believe he went to school f- f- like maybe he went to Berkeley, so he definitely has like a jazz guitar background. But he's played in a lot of rock bands, and so there's that. <laughs> you got um, that vibe for sure. I yeah, love yeah. It, man, it was like guitar lends itself to that. I think. There's, I mean, I don't think destructive is the right word, but there's just such a like a, a brute force that can be present in the guitar that mm-hmm. a lot of people like are intimidated to. No, right. I shouldn't say intimidated, but I guess in the jazz world, like we're talking about being it being taboo to 
flip on the distortion pedal and play power chords. Even. Right. Yeah, yeah. He was like, nah, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you have such a wide range of, like, it's such a huge sonic palette that the guitar is yeah. capable of. Yeah. It's like, might as well use all that stuff. That's right, man. If it's, you know, if it makes sense in the circumstances. I also think most guitar players, and I don't think most, but I should say, for me and for other guitar players, uh, as we've discussed, the role of guitar, it's like we're trying to be piano players, you mm -hmm. know, because in jazz, it's like, you know, you go through history and piano is the harmonic instrument. And right. not to say that it, the guitar can't be, but when the guitar plays the role of the harmonic instrument, in some ways, you're trying to assume the role of a piano. Right, right. Or it's almost like I just remember me and John always growing up trying to think about being like a piano player because then you give that full support and you're not just like, you know, I don't know, being a guitar player. But now it's like... Right. Then you're like, wait, I forgot how to be a guitar player. Like, I forgot I can bend these strings and, like, do all this right. stuff, you know? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, a lot of people have a different approach to that. Like, one of my favorite guitar players in the world is Lage Lund. Oh, yeah. And, like, you're never going to see Lage, like, with a whammy bar. Right, and, like, with, right. <laughs> he might throw on some overdrive occasionally, but, he, yes. you know, he's, like, <laughs> not one of those cats that's, like, gonna play like rock out in that same way <laughs> right, right. um but i mean he's one of my favorite musicians uh, like the way he deals with you know being the harmonic instrument is it's not he gets away from like the, kind of one of the bad things that guitar players and piano players do sometimes is that you know i feel like for me, like the little bit I play guitar, mm. the voicings I learned are very like stock. Like this is my major seven voicing, and right. you get used to like the, a grip, yes. you're, like, and you just move that around. Yes. And so you, then all voice leading just like goes out the window. Totally. Um, so what what Lage is amazing at is like taking even two notes and using those like throughout a tune and just being like, well, if this note goes up here, and then make, like making wow. harmony, like it's actually, you know how it was in, you know, if you read through a Bach chorale or something. Sure, sure, know, totally. It's not yeah. just like chords moving around, it's like lines, four lines moving around. Um, for me, I think Lage is very good at doing that on the guitar. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm, that's a whole other approach. It is, <laughs> it's man, like, it's like implied harmony. It's like, it's mm -hmm. not what you play, but it's like what you don't play that implies those things, right? It's like, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, just, you could spend your life doing that. Like, how do I play voice leading on the guitar? Holy like, yeah. you know, like, have you seen those videos of Ted Green? Play? I haven't. No. Oh, okay. I, I love Ted you. Green, but which videos are There's those? There's this video like, of him at a, like, my favorite one is just him at a wedding. It's just, the video is like, Ted Green at Joey B's wedding. <laughs> and he's just playing standards on a telly and some yes. weird tuning. Like, it's really low. Oh. And then people are coming up to him and talking to him and stuff. And he's like, He'd keeping conversation <laughs> yeah, while he's playing just all a this wedding shit. like wedding it's <laughs> like wedding guitar player yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. playing like the most beautiful stand he's not soloing he's just playing the melodies wow. but with these like incredible like chord and like voice leading i'll, I'll play it for you after dude i would love done. to yeah, <laughs> yeah man, you have to hear amazing. this yeah. yeah talk about like totally different guitar players like before y'all started at new blue it was like i walked in and I turned to my left and I was like, oh shit, Gilad Hexelman, what's up, man? Oh, I was just yeah. like nerding out over being super fanboy. But then it was mm -hmm. just like, oh fuck, if Gilad's in the audience, like I wonder what this guitar player on stage is gonna do, you know? <laughs> and then just to see him totally like do his own thing. Right. It was like, amazing. like when he took his solo, I thought he was still playing melody. It was beautiful. Man. Yeah, yeah. So lyrical. And it was just like, absolutely. I love that, man. I loved it. Yeah. I'm a total guitar nerd, so I love all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's tight. Now, speaking about guitar nerds, I remember your mom told me uh, a couple of years ago that you were almost going to be the bass player for Pat Metheny. Oh, I mean, I almost did a gig with him. I mm. mean, he, he called me to do a gig like down in Mexico mm. and then... With Antonio? Did yeah, with happen? Antonio. It was just going to be a trio thing. Wow. And it's... It, uh, yeah, that gig got canceled like the promoters like canceled the show, like something didn't go through and the gig mm. ended up not happening. So I was like, yeah, oh, man, <laughs> oh, I would love to play with that. Um, but he wasn't like putting a new trio together or anything. It, it was, was just, just kind of like a one-off gig yeah, yeah, and he yeah. wanted a bass player and then the gig ended up getting canceled. And, I was like, and then he went back on the road with Orchestrion or something. Like yeah. That. <laughs> something like that. And then did a whole bunch of other projects. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I love Pat's music and, mm. man, 
I've got a lot of his records sitting over there on vinyl also. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, if you, uh, who's like a guitar player that if you could play with, you would play with? Um, man, there's a lot. Let's Alan, see. I'm guessing? Yeah, well, <laughs> I know. But, uh, let's see about him. He passed a couple of years ago. Right. I'd always... Yeah. Dead or alive. Right. Yeah, right. well, right. man, then there's a huge I know, list. there's like, so much, yeah. H Hendrix, for sure. <laughs> but if I could pick anybody, I'd, I would love to play a gig with Jimi Hendrix. Um, oh my God. Apparently, <laughs> one of my dad's best friends, this really great bass player, lives in Seattle, this guy, Jeff Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, he's a really interesting dude. But he played a gig with Hendrix once, apparently. Like, wow. I think they were coming through. Um, I think he's from Minneapolis. And like the bass player, Noel Redding, got sick. And they needed a replacement really quickly. Holy and he shit. was like 18 or something. My dad asked him about it. And he's like, man, what was that like? And he's like, well, it was loud. And it was the blues. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man. I love it. Um, so that's wow. incredible. Um, Charlie Christian, I would, man, also from Oklahoma. <laughs> I didn't know he was from Oklahoma. Yeah, wow, it's a long list of like surprising cats, like um, Oscar Pettiford and Don Bias and Chuck mm. Baker, like a lot of cats. Um, uh, I would really would have loved to have played with Holsworth mm. and of guys that are alive now that um, I really love. Pete Bernstein's playing. Ooh. We've never gotten a chance to play. Oh, Peter Bernstein. And so I mean, bad. Kurt Rosenwinkel is amazing. Yes. And we've, uh, yeah, we've never played. I just mm. saw him a couple weeks ago at the Vanguard. Nice. The band sounded really great. Was Aaron playing with him or someone else? Mm -hmm. playing? Yeah, Aaron was playing. Um, is he usually, usually, using, usually using Cho or who's he playing? No, it was, this was uh, Eric Rivas. Nice. But Eric sounded amazing. Mm. He's such awesome. a great bass player. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what comes to mind just off the top of my head. Awesome, but <laughs> Grant awesome. Green, I would love to have played with Ooh. Grant Green just to know what that feeling. Yeah. And w Wes also. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness, man. I love it. And what about uh, what about bass players? If you could do like a duo gig with a bass player, dead uh, and alive, man. Uh, ooh, that's like Wilbur Ware. That would be amazing. Mm. <laughs> Or like Charlie Hayden, maybe. Wow, yeah. Um, wow, as far as guys now, let's see. That's Yeah, that's a hard choice. Um, I don't know. I like Larry Grenadier's playing a lot. It would be fun to do. We actually did play for, we played a four-bass like, tribute to Ron Carter one time. Really? Yeah, it was me and Desron Douglas and uh, Larry and John Benitez. Wow. It's such a random assortment. Uh, for those guys, they're all great bass players, mm. and yeah, all on upright. Yeah, That's all so on cool, upright. Man. And Joe, uh, Joe Sanders wrote a four bass arrangement of um, "You Are My Sunshine." Wow, because <laughs> Ron plays that a lot when he he does like a little really? solo bass version of that at gig sometimes. Oh, I didn't know that. So yeah, that was hilarious. Well, Ron, I would say Ron. Sure, oh my sure. God, that would be pretty much at the top of the list was he ron was at one point teaching bass at juilliard right he was yeah yeah and after then, you i'm guessing mm -hmm, after me yeah he's not teaching there anymore i think mm -hmm. there was a dispute about the juilliard when i was there too they didn't want the bass players using amps ever what and ron was like um it's not cool like they, you know they're in the big band like killing themselves trying to Whoa. um i believe Getting blood blisters, yeah. Oh, man, it totally, <laughs> in a way, like, I, it did help me, like, like learn how to get a sound out of the bass. Yeah, but, really pull on that bass, yeah. But the bad side, like, if you go too far and you, you can get an ugly sound, and, like, that's bad, too. But, um, did you ever develop, like, tendinitis from doing that kind of stuff? Or even just luckily, no, I've, I've been cool so far. <laughs> awesome. I try and keep it together, I, you know, physically. Yeah. You know, yeah, I took a few lessons from Ron too. And it Did was, you? Yeah, yeah. It's, mm. He's such an incredible teacher, and he really doesn't charge that much. Like, really? I mean, it's <laughs> like, man, it made me feel bad. I was like, this is what I charge for a lesson, and like, he's Dang. Ron. Like, he could be charging like four times this amount of money. Um, but I think he seems to really enjoy teaching. And That's awesome. Like, man. he's like discovering like himself through the process of explaining what he does. Like. That's really cool. Yeah. 
I remember I came to New York uh, about like eight years ago for the first time. I saw you when I was here because I went to Winter Jazz Fest and oh, nice. we were hanging out with me, John, my sister, and my friend Ryan oh, Mel. Nice. And, uh, and Doug Lawrence had put me in contact with Peter. To, I wanted to take a lesson with him because I mm-hmm. love Peter. And yeah. Doug was like, yeah, yeah, he'll give you the deal, you know, so and so. And it was like, I called him up. And at that time, he was like, oh, yeah, all right, no problem, man. The lesson's 150 bucks, which mm-hmm. nowadays I know is not very much. But at the time, yeah, I was right. just like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I can't do it, man. It's like all the money I brought on the trip. It wasn't, but it was just like, you know. Right. That opportunity to like study with someone amazing, that then you're just like, oh, shit, I can't afford this. But right. to have someone like Ron, who was just like, damn. Oh, man, he charges 100 bucks. What the fuck? I know. It doesn't make any sense. But um, but it's amazing being here. You just have access to, like, almost everybody's cool. And so just be like, yeah, sure. I'll get together, do a lesson, whatever. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Man, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, Matt. Yeah. I really appreciate likewise. you coming on the podcast. Of course. I, uh, I hope that, that uh, I'll get to see you in October when you come. You're going to be coming in October to play with SF Jazz Collective in yeah, Santa Fe, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe like the first weekend in October or something, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, at the Olympic <laughs> Center. Oh, I could tell you, but I, I forget. Yeah, man. Because yeah. I'm sure people in New Mexico would love to come check you out. Yeah, I hope so. And I'll be I putting this that. out before then for sure. So Cool. Yeah, I don't have the exact date, but <laughs> I think Hopefully second week of good. October sometime we'll be, be in Santa Fe. That sounds awesome. Now... If I can ask you a couple last questions, man. So, like, when when you get the opportunity to play someone else's music, what's the the first way you go about approaching their music? Like, when someone calls you and you have never played with them, do you go listen to some of their old stuff if they have it, or do you just like check out what they send you? Like, I like ideally thinking like someone who's an older musician, like Gonzalo, when they called you or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Well, luckily. I mean, with Gonzalo, I had already checked out. You already knew uh, who he was before. Yeah, the yeah, and checked out a fair amount of his music. But yeah, I definitely then went and checked out more. So I mean, the first like major gig I had was with Greg Osby, and I think I was nineteen when I just yeah. joined his band, and I knew some of the stuff, but not that much. So then I was like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna check out more of the records, and then I got all the music, and then he kind of was like oh and if you could memorize it like that'd be cool and if so, you could memorize the all the tunes like the stuff that Greg's. he sent right and right, so right, right. i did and i showed up to rehearsal and he was like he was really surprised because he didn't actually think it would happen wow and so you know i mean i had never had a good gig before and i just didn't want to lose it so course, i was like let me do everything i can to not be fired um <laughs> yeah so that's generally the process like first it's you know check out the stuff that I was sent and most of the time I'll listen to the record um not a hundred percent of the time I mean sometimes it feels good to have no idea of like what the person on the record played (laughs) Mm. (laughs) to just have just come with some kind of a with your own like a fresh yeah uh take to it but I kind of go back and forth with that so Hmm. there's no really I don't really have a rule (laughs) sometimes I'll check out the record and that's very helpful and other times I'll just look at the music um if there's some really specific like hard bass stuff then I'll definitely like listen to the record too and like make sure I get it but Hmm. yeah I feel like one of the reasons I ever improve at music (laughs) is just because people send me music that I really have to practice and study to be able to to you play know, and execute, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Speaking about playing and executing, just to jump back on the new blue gig, mm-hmm. did you read that song before that was seven, like in the meter seven point five, or did you just read that on the spot? Oh no, we. I mean, me and Aaron got together and rehearsed it once. You said that. So uh, all the songs once, or just yeah, like just once. the hard stuff. Yeah, no, we rehearsed everything. Nice. I don't know. He came over here and we like played a little bit, and then like you know opened a bottle of wine and I had dinner I think you know it was like, nice. it was very yeah, yeah, very yeah. chill yeah. um but I mean me and Aaron have been playing a lot with this with this oud player and great singer Doffer Youssef mm-hmm. and I I can tell like that song kind of sounds like the way Doffer deals with rhythm mm. um I mean Doffer is from Tunisia and there's a whole uh way of thinking about rhythm and music that's very deep and uh I mean the way the meters are felt 
just seemed very natural. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I guess I, the language of that rhythm felt kind of natural, or I felt You'd used, been used to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So I mean, what is is that the meter? Because it changes. It felt like at one point I was just like trying to count. I was like, oh, there's seven and then it jumps right on the end. So it was like, I had to have been seven and a half. Oh, it's a bar of four, then a bar of three, 16, and uh, then a bar of five. And then that cycle repeats over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there, is there a type of music? Well, I, this is kind of a weird question, you know, because there's so much out there. But like, mm. what? What is a bar for hard? I mean, when you're doing stuff like that, like for musicians hearing that, they're just like scratching their head thinking like, what the fuck are you <laughs> going to play over that? How, how do you even solo over that? Like, I just like, right. you're like lost in space at that point. You're just <laughs> like moving through time and like, however you can. Yeah. Well, I don't know, for me, I'm just like, I try and internalize those rhythms and not think about them. Right? <laughs> That's the easiest way for me to do it. Like, if I'm counting on stage, I'm, in totally trouble. in trouble. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, and that's actually one thing that Bata has kind of taught me. Like, hmm. there's, I mean, there's not really much like in odd meters or whatever. Mm. Although there, there's some cycles that would be a lot to get into. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, just yeah. the having to be able to play your rhythm and hear other parts going on at the same time and reacting to them. Like for me, I feel like you have to, everything has to be so internalized that you don't think about it. And so yeah. I feel like rhythms are like that too, in a way. So like a meter has a certain feeling and if I can just internalize like the structure of it, I don't know, it's hard to explain. <laughs> no, no, that totally yeah, makes sense, yeah. man. It's like, you're not thinking about it. Like, uh, I, I just heard this. It wasn't that I heard it from, uh, from the great, uh, what's, what's that that African guitar player that sings with this stuff and does Osa, even though he really doesn't speak the language? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, Lean Luweke. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lean Luweke mm -hmm. talks about like playing all these different meters and stuff, but he feels everything in two. Uh, oh, interesting. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like <laughs> crazy. This idea of just like feeling it all and like internalizing with mm -hmm. what you're saying and not overcomplicating it yeah. with thinking like. I mean, it's 13 beats or right. <laughs> I feel like some friends of mine from Cuba, like, like Yosvani, when, when he's explaining his music to me, I feel like he'll, he can tap clave with one hand mm -hmm. and then tap a different rhythm that he's trying to show me with another hand and like sing the melody on top of that. So there's all this stuff going on. And for him, I think the clave is just automatic. Like that's just, you can just turn it on and go and yeah, then yeah, yeah. sing any rhythm on top of it. Right. Um, so I'm working on that too, but that's, awesome. that's I mean, <laughs> very far from, but yeah. I feel like that's the exact same thing. So if there's a yeah. groove that's like, okay, a bar four, then three sixteen, then five, like if I can figure out what it feels like to me and just have that automatically somewhere in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, for me, that's my process of like being able to play that music and make it feel natural and yes. not just stuck to the bass line. Right, like right, right, right. You're holding way. on for dear life. Yeah. I get that feeling sometimes when I'm playing music this odd meter. I was mm -hmm. like studying, I still study uh, quite a bit of North Indian classical music, but mm -hmm. every time I play music that is like not in common meter that I'm just like trying to have to feel, it's like, fuck, man. Yeah. <laughs> and you think about it too much, you're, you're definitely fucking up. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what about like, uh, I mean, harmonic stuff? Is there any like difficult harmony stuff for you now? Or you feel like like, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, everybody's everybody I play with has kind of a different approach. Mm -hmm. So you know, having to navigate all like everybody's kind of language that has definitely taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I still just practice basic stuff I feel, I feel like the older i get the more i'm just like back to like the simple things that, like what um well this is not even really simple but just like bot corrals like four-part corrals hmm. i feel like i've learned a lot about voice leading and harmony and just like trying to sight read those on the piano that's definitely taught me a lot um there's a lot of classical music i really love like like scriabin i feel like the harmony is really interesting yeah um and Messian, it's definitely a big influence hmm. in terms of that. So, I mean, every once in a while, I'll, you know, 
sit down at the keyboard over here or like turn the synth on and like <laughs> try and play. <laughs> That's what I like. Man, I could turn on this synth and just like play through Bach chorales all night. And just, wow. You know, it yeah. just feels like it's so satisfying. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, back to Osby, like thinking of harmony outside of jazz nomenclature was like opened up some things for me where there's just like a cell of like three or four notes and you have to sort of extrapolate what that harmony is supposed to be. Yeah. And it's just those notes moving to different places and, you know, which is that's that's what box music does. Um, that's yeah. amazing. It's a funny story with Greg, man. <laughs> Greg came to town with uh, Jim Hall. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. And uh, played, you know, the show uh, at the Outpost. It was the first time Tom was cool enough to let me, you know, I was always, you know, like interning and like volunteering and helping out over there uh, as much as I could just to, you know, get into shows for free or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, help out. And uh, Tom was like, you know, Jim Hall's coming. Da, da, da. You want to go help me pick him up from the airport or the hotel and bring him to the soundtrack? Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, yes, I would love to, you know? Yeah. Well, that's another guy I should have put on my list. But Jim Hall? But yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, Definitely. my goodness. My goodness. Um, now, nah, he can't, you know, we, we picked him up. We picked up the cats, and they all came to the to the space. And, and then, you know, I was, I was just helping out however I could. So I was asking, you know, Jim, however I could help him out. And he's like, yeah, you know, grab my guitar. So I carried his guitar in for him and set it down on the stage next to him. And anyways, he didn't have a tuner. And for some reason in my mind, I was thinking like, oh, shit, he needs a tuner. Mm-hmm. And like, I was like. Mr. Hall, did you forget a tuner? Like, do you want me to go get my tuner for my car? And he's like, no, oh, no, I'm okay. Like, you know, just play that note on the piano. And then Greg was like, yeah, and that's just digital too. <laughs> like, and then all of a sudden, Tom pulled me aside and was like, did you just ask Jim Hall if he needs a tuner? <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you, man? <laughs> like, <laughs> a bit hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> that was so offensive. And I didn't even, like, think about it. But it was just like, right. all of a sudden, everyone looked at me from being like, you know, the cool cat girl was just like... This jive needs a tuner. I was like, <laughs> I'm sure Jim was cool. Uh, Jim was incredibly cool. He yeah. was so sweet. He was like the mm. nicest guy in the world. But it was just like Greg's vibe turned to me. Was just like I realized. Like I was like, oh, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> 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 Hilarious. <laughs> Ran off like a dog with my tail between my. Oh, arms. Awesome. <laughs> you have to have those experiences Greg when you're younger. Though. <laughs> totally, <laughs> man. <laughs> you learn by uh, by getting hit in the face sometimes with the reality. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Now, who, if um, if you could, if you if you could think of one person that influenced, uh, like like playing in their band, would you think it was Greg or like who influenced you the most? Or I should not not influenced you. I should say, like, what experience playing in a band made you mature? Like made that jump to the right. next level? Well, I definitely playing with Greg because that was the you were nineteen, of course. Yeah, right. so those uh, those are really formative years musically. I think. Um, cause I mean, yeah, I could play, I guess, but I didn't really have any level of like maturity or whatever. So like mm. that was my first time being on the road. So like doing a, a tour and playing night after night. And then the band at that time was Jason Moran and Damian Reed. Mm. Um, and when Damian was playing some stuff like rhythmically, that was like far beyond anything I'd knew so i was like just having to contend with that and being like wow like don't get lost like, yeah <laughs> and and also jason like rhythmically and harmonically like so like open and i mean and also solid and yeah. <laughs> adventurous yeah. and then um and yeah i mean i just started also trying to copy the stuff that greg plays like <laughs> i mean he has a really kind of distinct way of improvising and I mean, after playing with him like night after night, I was like, I want to be able to play that language on the bass. Like I wouldn't, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I mean, there's just something from that comes from touring and being on the road that gives you, that makes you solid and mature. And that was my first experience doing that. So, yeah. what was it being? What was it like being on the road underage? <laughs> um, well, do you ever have any issues with the clubs or anything like I that? I know. I mean, luckily in Europe, you know, it's all good. It's you know, yeah, once you yeah, turn yeah, eighteen, right. it's You're fine. Legal, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, we toured some in the states, um, but I mean, even in New York, 
Also, I like I was already bald basically. <laughs> like I didn't have hair then either. So I think I looked older. You were already bald in nineteen. Like pretty much. Like definitely thinning hair. Uh, yeah, he's good enough to drink a beer. <laughs> right. I think I I didn't necessarily look nineteen. Like maybe yeah. looked young, but yeah, yeah I mean yeah. I definitely all the clubs in New York I was already like drinking and like <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I mean Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nobody cared. Uh, so no, I didn't really run into any problems, <laughs> but I remember going on the road with Marcus Gilmore when we started playing with Gonzalo and he was like 18 or 19 or something wow. and yeah. <laughs> being in some club and they just put big X's on his hands and marker. <laughs> oh, yes. <to> <laughs> oh, I, <that> like, <laughs> my least favorite thing. I'd go into the bathroom and wash them off as much as I could and they wouldn't. They'd just be like faded X's and you're like, I still see you underage. <laughs> I know. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you first went on the road, what was it like to practice? I mean, still, like nowadays, what's it like practicing on the road? Because you're on the road, would you say maybe over 200 days a year or less than that? Well, maybe half. It depends. 100, this, 100 plus days a year? Yeah, def- definitely over 100. Um, I forget what it was last year. but I never really keep track, but mm-hmm. I'm going to mm-hmm. guess. It's hard to keep track of Yeah, <laughs> more than half, I think. Um, yeah. But, the, you know, I don't travel with a base, so... Unless I'm playing electric on the gig and then I might have that. And, but so the practice will normally just come down to sound check. Yeah. I mean, practice with the instrument anyway. And yeah. there's just yeah. other stuff like, Oh, I'm going to work on rhythm or whatever, or, uh, just certain, like just tapping exercises or whatever, yeah. or transcribe a solo, like work on ear training, you know, yeah. try and transcribe something without an instrument again. And, right. You know, uh, that type of stuff. Is that something you got into like like early on when you were first touring with Greg and stuff like that or just like from when you were starting to tour later and you're like, fuck, what am I going to do with my time? Right. I mean, yeah, I was with Greg. I mean, I used to carry around a frame drum and <laughs> like really? sitting right there. The, um, like this frame drum? Yeah. Damn. I would carry that around and just like... On tour? <laughs> yeah. And into your bag or how would you travel with that? Yeah, a little bag for it and I would just like carry it on the plane and... Uh, much more minimal now but when i was a kid i just brought a big ass suitcase and brought all my stuff and like, that's awesome uh, yeah. you know, before i knew better um, <laughs> right uh, but yeah i would annoy everybody with that like, <laughs> <laughs> like in the room practicing that and then yeah. i remember being on the road with tommy crane and we were next door to each other and he just called like dude can you shut up <laughs> <laughs> like, um I mean, every once in a while, I'll bring a guitar if I if I really need to write and yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. Oh, but there's yeah, there's all kinds of stuff outside of playing the bass that you can want to get better at. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like what else? Like I know you say guitar playing, but like what? Else? Yeah, I mean just the building blocks of music, <laughs> like just anything about music. That, you know, I want to get better at. I want to have better rhythm and yeah, yeah, yeah. I you know, want to have better ears. It's just so, like, even just hearing you talk about this, just like, you know, I know I, I, I certainly have opportunities where I think about music and getting better at music away from the guitar just because I love singing or, I, you know, I'm, I love other musics uh, mm-hmm. to the extent of not being on guitar. But, you know, for a lot of people thinking about, like, not having their instruments, it's like they think, oh, I can't practice. You right. Know? Yeah, no, that's crazy. I mean, I mean, the goal is to just be better at music, and that's, like, bass is one aspect of that for me but that's it's also i mean the instrument you're just like operating a machine like you can teach anybody to do that like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um it's what's coming from you that's important and the yeah. Uh, yeah you know i would still like to get better at the bass but <laughs> of course no <laughs> um, but but mostly i just want to be a better musician and for me it kind of goes hand in hand. So the, I, th- I think any facility I have on the instrument, a lot of it comes from like hearing ideas that I couldn't yet play on the bass. And I'm like, well, okay, if I want to be able to play those, I need to, need to get some stuff on the bass together. <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, sometimes it, you know, should go hand in hand, hopefully. It's awesome. What does the voice play in your practice life? Oh, it's yeah, that's huge too. I mean, I I tell a lot of my students to do that, to to sing a lot when they play. Um, mm. So, 
uh, Rodney Whitaker and Ben Wolf both had me doing this, like just play through a standard, like, you know, with a two feel and sing the melody. And then over the two feel. Yeah. 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 And then try and do that in a different key. And then one thing that I think Ben Street showed me, uh, or maybe Wolf showed me this first, like, okay, can you, no, it was Wolf that showed me this. He's like, can you play the melody and sing the bass notes? And oh, I was like, I don't know if I can oh, actually. And he's like, why not? Like, you, you know, you can sing the melody. You can't hear like, he's like the bass movement is a melody too. Like you should be able to hear that. And I was wow. like, yeah, that's very true. So a lot of times he would sit down at the piano and not tell me what key he was going to play in. And he would just start playing the melody to something. And then he'd be like, find the bass notes. And like, and if it took too long, he's like, man, you need to get faster at this. So, wow. <laughs> so singing. Damn. And I'll also have students just say like, okay, pick a, a note, like just sing any pitch and be mm. like, okay, that's going to be the first note of all the things you are like. So start singing it and then find the bass notes. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. important. And also being able to sing what you play, um, not necessarily like mimicking what you're playing, but actually like playing ideas you hear in your head. Yeah, yeah. hearing you it first and then playing it. Yeah. Not singing what you're right. Playing, yeah, right. you should, that should, everybody, you know, should be able to do that, I think. That, that's the like, goal. That gets in like the grips thing that we're talking about, right? It's like you're mm -hmm. so used to like certain things on the guitar that then you're like, oh, I'm singing what I'm playing. And it's like, no, 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 actually you're just like playing something and then you're trying to match it with your voice. But it's Yeah, like, well, that's a different thing. To lead with your voice is hard, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, back to like thought corrals, like this is one, Ben Street showed me this, like just play, uh, start out maybe just playing one voice, like, and then singing the other voice. So yeah, yeah, saying yeah. like, you know, playing the bass part of the corral and sing the alto part or something or vice versa. And then yeah. add like, okay, play bass and tenor voice and sing the soprano voice and eventually, wow. you know, play three voices and sing the one that's missing. And, trying to do that um yeah i mean that's the best ear training it's just uh, wow. singing for sure and it's also that was the first instrument i'm sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> for all of us uh, like, even if we heard right is like our mom speaking right yeah yeah i think you know voice and drums are you know in the history of humanity <laughs> like the first things that <laughs> yes. made music you know um i'm sure it was somebody just like yelling something or, or somebody hitting something with a stick yeah yeah that is funny because today i still think people respond to those two instruments the most like when you go to a show and like people get super excited when there's a drum solo like the drummers get all the house like at a jazz concert <laughs> i feel like drum solos are like kind of the highlight for um and people also, like, obviously love singers often, right it's like yeah yeah the drum solo is like the highlight right mm -hmm. i'm sorry that's true they don't yeah they don't get a solo on like every tune usually, right so. right right um but i think there's something about those two instruments that, like it's the primal root of music and people still are most affected by like voice and drums so. totally, man. <laughs> yeah. it's so funny you know in Albuquerque, we always talk about like at scala whenever there would be the jam session on tuesdays that now doesn't happen but i mean it's like all the jazz musicians would be so bummed out when a singer would come up on stage because it was like mm -hmm. the whole restaurant's like super loud. Everyone's up on stage playing these killer solos. And the restaurant's just loud as heck. And then a singer gets up there and she might not even be the greatest at all, but just mm -hmm. like starts singing a couple words and all of a sudden the whole place gets quiet. Right, right, right. Like, oh shit, what's happening? Yeah. Damn. People it's really tight. respond to it. It's really true. Yeah. But it's tight I, as well as a bummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know because also, I mean, I do this with students a lot too where we'll play through a tune i'll be like okay you play the melody and i can tell if they don't know the lyrics because like they'll play some version of the melody like a rhythm that sounds really funny and i'm like if you knew the words you wouldn't have played that rhythm uh, like man if you don't listen to singers i mean if you look down on singers like you really have a problem <laughs> seriously like, man yo um you know i mean you can't play the standards without having heard people sing them i think people used to always say that or I, I, not people i should just say I, I used to hear that in like you know podcasts or just interviews with musicians and they'd be like i can tell a lot from hearing a musician play the melody mm -hmm. and that's why like the more i For know sure. now is like that's why 
Mm -hmm. you know and it's like it's why you know Asher Barreras or Michael Glenn and I were just talking about this the other day he told me to tell you hello oh, he was, nice. yeah he was like a, um, one of the first bass players I ever met that was like no like knew the lyrics to everything right <laughs> and it's just like that experience of like yeah well you're not just knowing the lyrics because it's like it's good to know it's because like that connects the melody and makes sense with how you should be playing the melody right it's like mm -hmm. If you didn't know, it's like all of me, and you were just like boom, but um, it's like oh shit, it's right? A disjointed. It feels weird. Something's not right. right, you know. Or people will add or leave out syllables and stuff. Like I mean, rhythms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that are not <laughs> same thing. Yes, um, yes. But, uh, I'm trying to think of an example because it like just happened. I was teaching a lesson, and I was like, "You for sure don't know this." the lyrics to the song um i think it was it can happen to you hmm. and like they knew the miles version which is killing it's i mean it's not at all taking anything away from that but it's like he's playing his version of that and i'm like that's not if you knew the words like that's not how that goes um because it shows you what the rhythm is and what you know but there's also i mean it's helped how i improvise also like I want to be able to have a vocal like quality on the bass, totally. especially the upright bass. It's a fretless instrument. So it's like, there's, it's a good vehicle for like vocal like expression, I think. Absolutely, and, man. Yeah. It's, I always love playing with Asher because he, every solo, every song that he plays, like even if he doesn't know the song and he just like heard it or just like learned it recently, it's like, first thing he does when he takes a solo is he plays a melody mm -hmm. and it's like that sets the tone you know? right it's like it yeah he lays out you know what the what the vibe is man mm -hmm. i know so many times like you go to a jam session and people play the melody and then you hear a bunch of solos that have nothing to do with the melody at all that's <laughs> crazy it's always man. weird to me because like my favorite improvisers like sound like they're connected to the tune in some way like you don't have to quote the melody in a really obvious like didactic way or something you can just like i don't know use some of the pitches or do something to be like involved with the melody i don't know yeah i also just remember like thinking about that when michael glenn would put that on me and be like you know learn the lyrics and stuff mm -hmm. is like you know you're learning the emotional context or setting of the song sure and yeah. you're not just like going all crazy you know on how insensitive or something right right, you right. Know? <laughs> Yeah, and it's true, and it's not like you can't decide to change that or something. Right. But at least you know where it you're informed. Comes from. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you can't really improvise on a tune if you don't know the melody really well. Yeah. And bass players are the worst at that, I think. Sometimes because <laughs> we can get by by just like, well, I just play bass notes for you guys, and we. <laughs> like, but it's like it's. I mean, I'm guilty of that too. There's a lot of tunes where I like, I didn't necessarily learn the melody, and now I'm like. But if it comes up, if I play a tune that I know I don't know the melody, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go home. And, and that's another ear training thing for me, too, where I'm like, I've heard it enough times. Let me just figure out what the melody is <laughs> without having to listen to it. And yes. Say, you know. Yeah. That's beautiful. Matt, it's been amazing having you on the podcast, my oh, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much again for being on, for the hospitality, man. For, of course. You know, having me over to your place. Yeah. It's Anytime. wonderful to see you, and I hope to see you again soon, man. Yeah, for sure. And we'll definitely do a part two down the road, all right? Great. Sounds good, man. Thank you, Brother Matt. Cool, yeah. Thank you. That was the podcast, y'all. Thank you so much for listening. Now, as I told you when this podcast first started, we're going to get to listen to one of the beautiful tracks from Mr. Matt Brewer's most recent album called Unspoken, and it features Ben Wendell, Charles Altura, Mr. Aaron Parks, and the great Taishan Sori. So I hope you sit back and enjoy this wonderful track called Lunar. 